Hello and welcome. Are you ready to meet your eye microbiome? I'm Stephanie Stuart Bailey, the museum specialist for the Trollson Marmor Museum of the Eye. Today I am snug in the museum's archive room where we keep a portion of our 30,000 piece collection. Together with Jenny Benjamin, the director of the museum, we are pleased to welcome you and to be in conversation today with specialists from the University of Pittsburgh Ocular Microbiome Immunity Laboratory, as well as the Campbell Eye Microbiology Laboratory. You may be familiar with the idea that your gut and skin are home to a collection of microbes, fungi, bacteria, viruses, that are vital for keeping you healthy. But did you know that your eyes also host a unique menagerie of microbes? Together, they're called the eye microbiome. When these microbes are out of balance, too many or too few of certain types, eye diseases may emerge. In this two-part series, we are doing a deep dive to better understand the microbiome of the eye. Within the past decade, studies assessing the eye microbiome and disease have boomed. They're generating an immense amount of data but most of it is based on correlation. This means that certain bacteria have been linked to certain diseases. However, whether these bacteria are causing these diseases is still unknown. Please note that throughout this program, we will be discussing cutting edge research that is still in development. We are in conversation today with Tony St. Ledger PhD, a professor and researcher at the University of Pittsburgh's Ocular Microbiome and Immunity Laboratory. He will help us understand the role microbes play in keeping our eyes healthy or diseased. Rob Shanks, PhD, is from Campbell Eye Microbiology Laboratory, which houses one of the most extensive collections of human ocular bacteria in the country. He will introduce us to a few common eye microbes found on your eyes as well as in their collection. It's my understanding that the two of you collaborate a lot, but I, I wanted to start off by maybe Tony, could you give us a little bit of an introduction to what you do on a regular basis? Sure, sure. Thanks for having me. And I'm excited to talk to Rob and you today about some of the uh, eye stuff we have going on. Uh, so I'm a classically trained immunologist, so I, um, my main interest is on how, how the body fights disease, but the focus of my lab is on how the body fights disease in the context of eye infections. And during my postdoc, I was able to find that there is a specific bacterium, Crinibacterium acidides, that has the potential of colonizing uh, the eye, specifically the conjunctiva underneath the eyelid. And we were able to show that this induces a protective immune response to um, prevent more serious pathogens like Pseudomonas aeruginosa or Candida albicans from infecting the eye. So now my lab is currently focused on understanding how that uh, ocular microbiome and ocular immune system sort of interaction help to prevent or promote disease. Brilliant. It's just also fascinating. Rob, could you give us a brief introduction to what you do? Sure. Uh, so if Tony is an immune cell, I'm, I'm the bacteria of the group here. <laughs> so I'm trained as a bacteriologist and a geneticist, uh, microbial geneticist. And uh, my group works on how the eye and the bacteria interact with each other. And we're looking at virulence factors, mostly on the bacteria side, but I'm also really interested in antimicrobial therapy and, you know, helping patients and developing new uh, microbial, antimicrobial therapy and the basis of resistance. So um, I work on that in my lab, and I also work with a larger group called the Campbell Lab that we can talk about. I'm wondering if you both could first define just what is a microbe and what is the microbiome? I can, I can do microbe if you do microbiome. How's that? Got it. Got it. Go ahead, Rob. <laughs> okay, so a microbe is any microorganism. That can be anything from a bacterium, which is found everywhere in the world, practically. Uh, and there are these small unicellular organisms that can grow very quickly. They can be uh, terrible and cause disease, but they can be wonderful. And we can engineer them to produce insulin, for example, in drugs or, you know, what or they can be used to get rid of uh, pesticides and things like that that can be bad in the environment. 
and then beyond bacteria, which you know I'm kind of focused on there. You know, of course, fungi. It can include viruses that Tony has expertise on, and you know, protists and, and anything that's very very tiny is as a microbe that's alive. Mm -hmm. Actually, let me bring up a picture. Uh, I think that might help illustrate some of what we're talking okay. about. So. As Rob said, microbe can be anything from a virus to a fun fungus to bacterium. The microbiome is more what is the what are the types of microorganisms that live in a specific area and colonize a part of the body. So there's been this movement towards understanding how the host or the human interacts with its own microbiome or the consortia of microbiomes in a specific site. So the most well-known area of the intestine, so there's trillions of bacteria in the intestine that range a whole slew of, you know, there's a bunch of diversity there in the bacteria. And we know that those bacteria can help uh, dictate whether you have intestinal health or intestinal disease with the advancement of sort of um, advanced genomics. Now we can sort of get at other areas of the body that that aren't as well known to have harbor a microbiome so like the lungs um, the skin and now we're we're seeing it in the eye and we know that in the eye there's a uh, reduced diversity of bacteria compared to sites like the in intestine or even the skin but we know there are you know there's there's evidence of bacteria there there's also evidence of virus there and people are now starting to get into the to the possible um, fungi that might be there. Um, so basically the microbiome can encompass all of those types of microorganisms. Huh. Um, well, you know, can you also describe the difference between bacteria, fungi, and viruses too? So sure. bacteria, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so, so bacteria, bacteria and fungi, they can live by themselves so they have all the machinery necessary inside themselves to to live obviously bacteria are single are unicellular and fungi are are a little more advanced so they're eukaryotes and viruses they rely completely on the host to, to replicate so they infect your host cells use your host machinery to replicate themselves and i'm sure i didn't do it as uh I'm sure, I'm sure I did some disservice, so I'll let Rob handle the rest of that. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's fine. I mean, you know, fungi include everything from mushrooms to uh, yeast, right, that we make beer and bread with. Notice I started with beer, but, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so yeah, and the bacteria can, you know, be E. coli that, you know, that mess up the, the swimming areas in the summer to, you know, to, you uh, to Staph aureus, like we can see in this picture, these those little cyan to blue colored uh, cells there are Staphylococcus aureus, and and of course we know about them from things like MRSA that cause numerous hospital infections, and uh, they can be, again, very bad or very very good. And then viruses like the coronavirus that we're all you know sitting in the reason why we're not meeting together is <laughs> you know, is because of the you know this pandemic caused by these tiny, really small microbes and and some of them are very small like so staph aureus for example might be one micron across and that's you know there's a million of those in a meter so it's like one millionth of a yard across is you know how, how big those cells are and you know incredibly small whereas you know a fungus like a a mushroom can be huge you know and you can see it in the in the park and and you know make your spaghetti with it <laughs> 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 when you look at the eye, when you look at the microbiome, you can do it in a couple of ways. You can do it by swabbing and then looking for live bacteria on plates. And there's some great aspects of that because you see what's alive and you can you know, see what's growing and it gives you, you know, relative amounts of each one that's growing. But it's also limited in, in terms of it was really biased by what kind of plate you grow it on. So certain bacteria like to grow on certain kind of plates. So some of them are very fastidious and they'll only grow on plate type A, but they won't grow on tape, plate type B, if that makes sense. And then you can grow them with lots of air or with almost no air, and that affects what grows. So basically, the, what you use to swab the bacteria on will depend, will tell you, it will kind of dictate what you get, right? Hmm. So there are some limitations to doing plate 
or culture-based assays. Mm -hmm. The alternative is to use, as Tony mentioned this before, uh, kind of early on, is that you can use DNA-based or even RNA sequencing-based methods. And these are great too, because you can get a wide variety of bugs. You can get, you know, if there's five bacteria of a certain type, you'll be able to tell us there, but you don't know if it's alive or not, right? So there are limitations to that as well, right? So a lot of studies nowadays are finding like pseudomonas DNA on the eye, but they're not necessarily growing them out. And of course, if you think pseudomonas in the eye, you get really scared <laughs> because it's a major ocular pathogen, right. but it's not clear that they're alive. So it's not, it's not hundred percent clear the significance of them at this point. There's a lot left to learn in this field, right? So it's a, that's kind of what's exciting and new about this field. Um, anyways, that's kind of a divergence from the streptococcus is that's really commonly found in the mouth, ah. right? And the mouth and the eye, the surface of the eye have lots of things in common, like we had the saliva in the mouth and tears in the eye, and they do a lot of the same thing. They have a lot of antimicrobials in them. Like our body doesn't necessarily want stuff growing out of control on us, right? Um, and uh, the difference is the teeth, I mean, I, I always think about it like this. I don't know about you, Tony, but the difference between the mouth and the eye is the mouth, uh, we have the teeth and it's like a place for the bacteria to hold on to, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas the eye does, doesn't have teeth. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a very convenient place for bacteria to hold on to. And therefore we have like a hundred times as many bacteria per cell, human cell in the mouth than we do in the eye. But on the other hand, if you have a, a contact lens, Right. And suddenly you're kind of putting a tooth in your eye. <laughs> you're putting you're putting like a platform for the bacteria to, to survive on. So have you thought about have you thought about it like that, Tony, or looked into the the literature on how the contact lens affects the microbiome? So there, there there are distinct differences in the representation of the microbiome where in contact lens wearers versus non-contact lens wearers. And I think it actually gets a little more, the diversity is, gets reduced. So you get a contracted microbiome, but also the extended amount of time that those bacteria are on the eye could cause some, you know, it, it increases the amount of exposure to, to the eye. So it allows the um, possibly bacteria to grow. Well, that makes me curious too, where on our eye is this bacteria? Is it generally like you're talking about like the contact lens covers the cornea and some of the white part of the sclera. So is that where it is if it's gonna stick? So we, we've seen it. So we've actually been able to um, genetically modify our bacteria that grows on mouse eyes and we see that it grows underneath the eyelid on the conjunctiva. We never see that it, it actually grows on the cornea itself. So I think it's pretty well known and well established that the cornea remains pretty sterile and, and bacteria can't really grow there. And I think it's probably because the, it's a hostile environment. And like Rob said, there's not really a place for the bacteria to adhere and to stick there. Mm -hmm. But if you go underneath your eyelid, there's much less exposure, there's much less movement, and it's a warmer area that's less exposed to the environment. You can you can probably imagine that that's a little bit of a better place for something to grow is mm -hmm. underneath the eyelid, as opposed to the, the central cornea. Yeah, the cornea, like uh, the cells in the front of it just come off constantly, like your skin cells yeah. are re renewed. The corneal cells are replaced. So I think it's every 10 days, your cornea, epithelium is renewed but all of our body have you know different biomes as I said I remember when they this first started happening maybe 20 years ago when people first got excited about this one and really it was kind of pushed forward when the DNA sequencing became more and more you know inexpensive and people could do this we were joking around what are they going to check next the the belly button and then a few years later a paper <laughs> From Belgium came out the, the microbiome of the belly button and I think it won an Ig Nobel, Ig Nobel Prize. I don't know if you've heard of those. It's a prize given out to something that's uh, you know it's good science but it's something that's a little bit you know crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the, the, the eye is and all of these microbiome analyses the eyes was always ignored so they did this huge human microbiome project through the NIH and they 
assayed all these different sites and then they totally neglected the eye because you know the thought was that there's there are no real bacteria there but now you start to see that there is like a sort of a core signature of microbes at the eye um that sort of tracks with geography or or ethnicity or um like i said uh, contact lens wear or not contact lens wears as well as age and yeah age too like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how does age play a part well, when you're first born, uh, you know, you pass through your mother <laughs> and, you know, the, you get the microbes from the vaginal canal and, uh, uh, and those are very prevalent. And then as you get older, I think it's quite uh, diverse and it kind of stabilizes around uh, at the end of adolescence. And then so the diploids, uh, another name for these could be uh, Carinibacter species. And an interesting uh, thing about these are is this is the type of bacteria that we found that colonizes uh, the mouse eye. And diphthroids are, have been considered sort of just commensal bacteria and they're largely ignored by a lot of micro, microbiology labs in eye research. But thankfully the Campbell Laboratory has a nice uh, repository of these bacteria that we were able to, to investigate. And what we saw in the mouse is diphthroids actually induce a protective immune response at the eye. And so what we've been able to you, do with the Campbell laboratory isolates are to see if those same human isolates induce the same uh, immune response in mice. And now we're moving to see if those uh, human isolates induce a similar immune response in human cells, mm -hmm. specifically uh, uh, blood cells. Um, to then move to possibly looking at eye cells as well. Pretty good. And, and these are commonly found on the skin as well. And, you know, and that's another one of the debates in, in this field is how much is a stable uh, microbiome in the eye and then how much is, falls into the eye from our eyelids and skin and so forth, you know, and is a hostile environment. And, uh, yeah, so that is something that we're still learning about. What we do, what we do know too, from what some of our preliminary work is, we got a few skin isolates or a few isolates that are known to colonize the skin, specifically the species of C. acolins. And what we found when we tried to colonize the mouse eye is that none of those species actually colonize. Mm -hmm. So I think that's sort of more support that, you know, not with with our work, we're hoping to possibly distinguish, you know, who are those sort of transient passengers to distinguish those bacteria from actually colonizers. Um, mm -hmm. So is what we're doing. Huh. Yeah, yeah. So, so when I was a postdoc in Rachel Caspi's lab, we found this uh, bacteria, creating bacteria mastitides that colonize the eye. And we sort of found it through a eureka moment uh, uh, that Rob sort of alluded to about uh, the certain types of plates that you need to use to, to, uh, to identify bacteria. So what we, we had the hypothesis that there's probably bacteria that live on the eye or live near the eye and they induce this immune, uh, a, a protective immune response. So we took a pretty crude approach, took a bunch of mouse conjunctiva, mouse eyelids, ground them up and spread them out on auger plates. And what we found was that there was a plate that we forgot about in an, in an incubator for a week and this incubator was starved of oxygen. Um, it turned out this Carinibacterium uh, species was able to thrive in that environment. So after a week, we saw this nice lawn of bacteria that we assumed was a contaminant from being forgotten in an incubator for a week. So we tried it again. Sure enough, this bacteria was able to grow. And it turns out, upon further analysis, what happened was that most of the bacteria in the eye grow relatively quickly and grow in a lot of different conditions. It wasn't until we starved all of those, all of those out competitors for oxygen that we, we were able to see this Carinibacterium mastitides grow out. And so what we were able to find was that this specific bug was linked to a specific protective immune response. But what we're looking at here is we were able to design a probe, a fluorescent probe, that binds to the Carinibacterium DNA. And what we saw was that whenever we took sections of eyelids 
you can see the, the pattern, you know, sort of a filamentous pattern of staining in the cranibacterium um, astididies there. And Rob can comment on it, but I know Rob has, has alluded to it before and a few other microbiologists have said that kind of looks like a biofilm mm -hmm. formation. That's how bacteria look when they form biofilms. I'm not an expert at that, but um, we're, we're starting to investigate uh, biofilm formation in this bug as well as others to see if that is a true um, phenotype in bacteria that can colonize the eye. Could you define biofilm for us? I can I can do that. Yeah. So bi <laughs> biofilms are communities of microorganisms that live on a surface. Um, you know, some people can say aggregates of bacteria that aren't on a surface, you know, but are attached to themselves or like a biofilm too. But when a bacterium or a fungus lives on a biofilm, or it becomes it changes its behaviors, and even though it's genetically identical, it becomes a lot more tolerant of um, hostile environments. So if the bacteria is able to form a biofilm on the ocular surface, then it's much more likely to be able to survive things in the tears that might normally damage it. And, and of course, this is beyond the normal situation where you see biofilms. And actually, a good examples of biofilms are if, if you didn't, don't brush your teeth and then put your tongue against your teeth and it kind of feels a little rough or fuzzy, that's a biofilm, right? <laughs> or if you don't clean your fish tank and the walls of the fish tank get a little bit uh, uh, blurry, <laughs> or you put your foot on a, a pebble or a rock in the in the stream, and it feels a little slimy. Those are classic biofilms, right? Uh, but they actually do afford protection to microbes. So the same bacterium in a biofilm versus swimming around freely might be a thousand times more tolerant of an antibiotic. So it can make them very difficult to treat. Yeah. But, yeah, but in this case, it might allow them to survive on the surface of the eye. That makes a lot of sense, huh? <laughs> I'm going to think of that every time I brush my teeth now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're using the biofilms, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> actually, I, I do want to comment a little bit more on Tony's work on that last picture. Is It's really in, in, interesting because you know, there's such a, there's so few bacteria on the ocular surface compared to other parts of the body. And if we think of the beneficial aspects of, of the microbiome in their gut, say, we think of it, it prevents other pathogens from colonizing. Well, there aren't enough bacteria on the ocular surface to do that, to be protective, right? They're not coating everything and preventing other bacteria from attaching or bad bacteria from attaching, but they could be affecting the immune system in a positive way. And I think this work here with Tony and Rachel really, you know, gives a mechanistic underpinning to that. And, and it was pretty important. And, and beyond that, the ocular microbiome, the gut microbiome seems to affect the eye's health. Isn't that right, Tony? Yeah, yeah. So, so there's the, there's these antibodies, it's called secretory IgA. And those antibodies help to bind to pathogens and sort of wash them away in mucus. And they're actually passed um, in mother's milk as well whenever um, moms are nursing their babies. And so what some researchers have found, um, they've been able to see that, that the gut microbiome actually induces that protective IgA um, to protect the eye from, from other sorts of pathogens. You know, I, I read a, a paper and I forgot when, but it was showing that um, germ-free mice, so, you know, these are mice that have no germs at all, no bacteria at all, and uh, um, they tend to develop dry, severe dry eye symptoms, you know, and then if they fed them normal bacteria back, you know, they didn't get this, right? So there's, there seems to be some kind of uh, connection there. Yeah, yeah, so, so the germ-free environment's kind of tough too, because you figure that these mice were raised in a totally, a totally artificial environment. So, so there's a lot of immune education that goes on very early after birth related to that intestinal microbiome. So you don't know if it's the microbes in real time that are causing that, or it's just, you know, sort of a defect from that germ-free condition. So I, th I think the germ-free condition is a beneficial one. I think it just needs to be interpreted, uh, interpreted, um, you know, judiciously, I would say.
Yeah, carefully. Yeah, no, I think that's true. But it does. It's an interesting link between the gut microbiome and and ocular health um, beyond subsequent infections, right? And and I, you know, yeah. you see papers people looking into does it affect other ocular problems such as macular degeneration and things like right. that. Right. Yeah. I think yeah, I think the neuro part of it too. So the they see that microbes in the gut directly stimulate nerves and the immune response to those microbes stimulates nerves and how does that transition between the brain and then the eye as well i think is an important link to sort of figure out too do microbes from the gut actually travel up the body and into the eye or is it just that they're triggering certain responses or correlations um can you talk about that or define that a little bit I think it's probably a little column A and a little column B, right? Yeah. So, I mean, there, there are cases where um, fecal bacteria have ended up in the eye. Mm -hmm. Rob can correct me, but I feel like that has happened in, in the clinic a bit. But I also think it, it's sort of this interplay between the intestinal microbiome and how your body senses it. So there's a lot of research right now going into the, like the neuroimmune connection between the microbiome and and how you fight disease and how you deal with disease. And I think a really important, a really good example that was brought up to me one time was, if you think about a kid, when a kid gets sick, you know, all they wanna do is sort of snuggle up with a parent and be close to somebody. But then as an adult, you just wanna go in like a hole and hide and you don't wanna be around anybody. <laughs> and it's like, you're really infected with the same pathogen, but your, but your response to that is totally different. And it's likely the immune response that you mount affects your nervous system and it affects everything, right? So, so uh, that, I think that's sort of an interesting thing to think about. Oh, that's super interesting. Yeah. 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 yeah there's a real connection between your gut microbiome and your brain and your, your moods and, and, and your mm -hmm. behaviors and, and hormones and things like that. Uh, and of course, I think, Tony, you're right. That's mediated through the nerves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, Rob, could you tell us a little bit about this? Sure, this is a, a picture of one of my, my favorite bacterium, called, bacteria called Serratia marcescens. And this one, this particular strain is actually, we call it chasm. So for compost heap acquired Serratia marcescens. Yeah, right here, yeah. And you can see that it, it has this great topography. So you know, one thing, one uh, way you look at bacteria and characterize bacteria are their shape, the shape of the colony, whether they're flat and smooth or if their edges are sculpted and so forth. And uh, this one was very distinctive and it had this really uh, unusual, some say beautiful, some say gross <laughs> <laughs> uh, appearance. And if you go back to the last picture, uh, we were trying to figure out you know how so one of the things we do in my lab is genetics so we try to break things in order to figure out how they work at the genetic level so you can see that almost all those bacteria there are rough they look like some of them look like miniature volcanoes coming off of the, the, of the plate but you can see there's sort of a shiny smooth one there probably around six you know around seven o'clock so we were looking that's a mutant so we we look for mutants that aren't able to make that shape and then we could figure out what genes are important for a specific uh, phenotype now of course this isn't um super eye related research but you know it's a good training for some of the undergraduate college students in my lab to learn some of these genetic things but relating it to the eye, this bacteria, um, not this particular one, which came from my backyard, but uh, they, they can cause um, ocular infections associated with contact lenses, especially. So. Yeah, well, then at a basic level, I, I guess, how do these microbes get on our eye? If it's in the compost, is it that it floats in the air and it just transfers onto your eye? Um, me touching well, something, then touching my eye kind of... Um, all of the above. Uh, I think a lot of these will get um, into the eye via contact lenses with um, from water. So a lot of these will be found in an aquatic environment. So strachia is often found in water. So is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Some of these pathogens that are the contact lens associated pathogens are, are found in water. Other ones like the ones like some of the staphylococci are found on the skin, right? And they can, you know, you rub your eye you know, you can scratch your arm and rub your eye and you can get staph in your eye, right? So uh, there are lots of ways you can get microbes in your eye, but the eye is 
unbelievably good at clearing them. I mean, you know, it's exposed and it's just amazing that we have so few bacteria on the surface of the eye for it being an exposed surface. Do we get rid of them primarily because of tears or how does that happen? I can keep talking about it. Yeah, yeah. So the, uh, the blinking uh, helps mechanically remove them, the desquamation of the cells being removed in the eye, and they just go, you know, down the tear ducts and, you know, into your stomach, it gets chewed up and go away. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, the I, eye is extremely So good. I didn't realize that your tear ducts works in both directions. I thought that it just produces tears. So did you just say microbes also travel through it to your stomach? Well, the tear ducts are actually go from your, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the perfect, I'm a bacteriologist, so <laughs> I'm not the perfect guy for this, but they go from, you know, they go from your eye, you know, into your nasal passages and then you know, down your throat into mm -hmm. your gut. Mm -hmm. That's correct, right, Tony? Yeah, yeah, that, that's good. So uh, you have tear glands that produce tears. So the tears come from the tear glands. And Tony, you, you actually work with the tear glands. So do you wanna- We do, yes. Those? We we look at, there's there's um, the tear glands. We we're finding that the bacteria that we use does seem to get back there. And then um, the immune, there's immune cells back there. Um, and there's a new, new study out from Europe where they were able to actually grow tear producing glands in a dish from organoids. So they, they can basically make a lacrimal gland from adult stem cells in a dish, which is kind of cool. So, th but th that's the way sort of, you know, you sort of have this high flow of, of mucus and tears that flows across the eye and washes uh, bugs away. And then also an interesting thing too, is whenever you sleep, uh, you have these immune cells called neutrophils that are routinely circulate throughout the body, but they sort of um, get out of the tissue and, and sort of bathe the eye overnight while you're sleeping. And then um, they get cleared away, but what they can do is they can eat up bacteria and things like that um, to sort of uh, facilitate the elimination of pathogens. Yeah, and the tears don't just wash away. They're actually full of things like Lysozyme, which is an enzyme yeah. that breaks up the, the walls of bacteria and, and enzymes like phospholipase that break up staphylococcus, you know, so it's full of things that are hostile to bacteria. It's, it's, it's not a good place to be <laughs> as a microbe. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a world within a world, though. It certainly is, yeah. A microcosm within a microcosm. Is, so, uh, yeah. I'll talk about this briefly. Yeah, this picture, we have a pseudomonas that can swarm and then right above it is a staphylococcus that can swarm. And one of the things I liked about this is it looks like the pseudomonas swarm is actually going toward the uh, staphylococcus. Um, and it, it's possible that, you know, there, there is an interplay with between microbes and sometimes microbes can be beneficial toward each other. Like one can make a compound that the other one eats and that it can't make itself or sometimes they fight, right? So uh, the ocular biome and biomes in general are really dictated by bacteria-bacteria interactions. Like, mm -hmm. like there's some bacteria that can only attach to your teeth after other bacteria first attached to it, your teeth, right? So- um, Do a little bit of a piggyback ride. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I don't know how much of this has been looked at on the ocular surface. I don't think very much. I, there's a lot left to learn. Uh, with uh, um, you know this important niche and you know what is going on between the microbes on the surface of the eye. Mm -hmm. um, I remember reading in some articles uh, that you're using, well, basically making steps towards developing therapies uh, to figure out how bacteria can colonize the eye. Yeah. So uh, with Rob's help, uh, what we're starting to do is we're incorporating. Uh, point mutations throughout the the genome of the of the Carinibacterium mastitides, and then we're assessing whether that makes the bug better able to colonize or worse. And the hope is that through that process, we're able to find the gene or genes responsible for colonizing the eye. And then if we find that, then you can start to compare those genes with with similar genes and other bacteria to see if those bacteria sort of have the potential to colonize the eye or if this is just unique to a certain uh, 
various species of bacteria. And then once you know that, then you can, you know, in parallel, what we're trying to do is perform those same mutations to look at, you know, what genes are responsible for the immune response to, uh, because that's the important part, right? So we were able to show that these bacteria help the immune system protect the eye. So if we know those genes, then you can start to manipulate those to either um, boost that immune response if somebody is more, more prone to infection or sort of suppress it sometimes. If you have an overactive immune system, you can have things like dry eye disease, Sjogren's syndrome, and things like that. So if we know which genes are responsible for, for those immune responses, maybe we can reduce those or um, eliminate them from the microbiome too. Yeah, uh, Rob, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, it seems that you might be able to find a specific protein that is beneficial to the immune system, right? Rather than adding a whole bacteria to the eye, you could just right. put a specific protein, right? Which in some ways might be safer, right? Because you, if someone is prone to infection and you put a whole bacteria, um, in many cases, it would be fine, but in some cases it might not be, right? So if you're just putting a single protein, you know, that would might be nicer. And then you could ship it and dry it. You know, there are many positives to having a specific yeah. protein. Basically, I'm coming from a museum that archives artifacts and you archive in a way microbes. Um, could you talk a little bit about the usefulness of that? Sure, let me just introduce a little bit. Uh, so our clinical microbiologist and head of the Campbell lab is Regis Kowalski. And he's been collecting ocular microbial pathogens since, and commensals, uh, since the early 90s, perhaps even a little bit before that. And so we have this wonderful and almost unique collection of, uh, that's going back, you know, decades of, of all these ocular pathogens. And for me, it's been fantastic in terms of, I, I'm interested in the virulence factors that microbes make, and, but also positive things that can come from microbes. And so since each bacteria is a little bit different, each one has a different catalog of genes, like each one's a book and each one has different pages, right? So uh, some of those might be really useful uh, in the future for, um, for helping people. And then it helps from Tony and I, Tony mentioned this before is, you know, he has this collection of carini bacteria um, and Tony can, he might be interested in C mastidides, but there are if I'm saying that right, but there might be a bunch of other, you know, carini bacterium that can teach you why C. mastidides is important and interesting, and just having that collection is really good. And and it does a few other things too. Is this if we want to test new drugs, if they're good antimicrobials, well, we have this collection that's out of actual human pathogens. Like right? so, we so the Campbell Lab works with a whole bunch of different uh, companies and other investigators to test new antimicrobials and things like that. And we have the real bugs that have caused disease and we can test them on. And then I guess the third thing that I can think of is, um, is you can see patterns of resistance developing. So, you know, one of the main things that the clinical laboratory does is test whether if someone has a pathogen, they have to know what the doctors have to know what to treat with, right? So if the, if the bacteria is resistant to antibiotic A, then REACH can say, don't use antibiotic A because it's not gonna work, right? So don't waste your time. So uh, we can look at trends in, in resistance and that's reported on the, the Campbell Lab website. So anybody can has access to those. Awesome, we'll share a link to that. Yeah, great. So something I'm noticing about all of this bacteria in the microbiome is some of it's actually very aesthetically pleasing. It's like art. And these are very, very colorful plates. And um, could you tell us a little bit about why there are these colors and patterns here? Sure, I'd be happy to. So a lot of um, microbiology has been based on how the bacteria grow and and how they react under certain environmental conditions. And you can use that to figure out which, what bacteria you're dealing with, right? If you have a, a red one, in this case, serratia is pretty easy to guess what it is, but many, many of them, they look a lot alike. So, you know, the, the doctors or the clinical microbiologists have been dealing with this problem and have devised all these clever ways to do it. And all the bacteria act differently. And in this case, on the left, we have a nuclease test 
And one of the characteristics of Serasia is it makes a lot of nuclease. So the whole plate started out as this beautiful cyan blue, but you put, put the bacteria on it and as it grows, it releases this enzyme called a nuclease and that chews up DNA that is in the plate. And that changes the color from that beautiful cyan to kind of a clear you know, background. So we know that that bacteria is positive for nuclease. And that nucleus actually is very useful. So people have used it in uh, when they prepare proteins, they often have a lot of extra nuclease like DNA that you want to get rid of. So you can add the serratia nucleus to it to clear up all of the DNA and get rid of that. So the, instead of having a really thick viscous uh, material to work with, you have a nice uh, you know, normal uh, fluid to work with. Uh, and the one on the right is a glucose dehydrogenase test. And that's actually not a normal diagnostic test. This is the one we made custom in the lab. And it's essentially like a very much like a litmus test. And, and some bacteria who produce this glucose dehydrogenase enzyme, they change the pH around them. And that changes the plate color from a, a purple to a yellow. So you can see the one at the top uh, doesn't, make, doesn't uh, make the glucose dehydrogenase and it doesn't have that zone of yellow around it. So this, these color plates are just very simple ways that we can differentiate, differentiate bacteria to one, determine what species they are, or to help determine what their genotype is, what, what they're capable of doing, okay? So the one on the left is what's called a blood auger plate, and uh, that is a plate that's, that's literally full of um, red blood cells from sheep. And uh, you can spot bacteria or streak bacteria on it. And some bacteria produce things, something called a hemolysin. And what that is, is the bacteria pops open the red blood cells in order to get the iron. So bacteria often starve for iron and other nutrients. So if they, uh, they produce something called a hemolysin, it will pop it, the bacteria, or it will pop the red blood cell open and the bacteria can use those, those goodies and, and grow much better. Hmm. And then the one on the right is, uh, one that is a, is a quorum sensing test. So bacteria can actually speak to each other through these molecules called quorum sensing molecules. And, um, and essentially it tells them when bacteria are few in number versus there are lots of them. And when there are lots of bacteria around, uh, they produce a lot of these quorum sensing molecules and that changes their behavior. So they'll act one way when there are a few bacteria, but when there are lots of them, they'll, they'll act differently. They have like a mob mentality and they often are more virulent in that way. And then this, uh, this plate here tells us whether they're producing the compound or not by the purple color. So the purple color surrounding those um, four spots indicate that those bacteria are secreting these um, quorum sensing molecules hmm. and lots of, um, in nature, lots of things have learned how to take advantage of that system. So quorum sensing is associated with things like biofilm formation. So some plants, for example, can produce uh, molecules that jam the quorum sensing system of bacteria and don't allow them to, that stops their ability to form biofilms, for example. I, for one, once went to a hacker lab where we got to experiment during an event with drawing with bacteria. And it sounds like you have also done this with some of your students. Yeah, that's right. So part of having a collection of bacteria is many of them have different colors. And, uh, you know, and as you can see at the plate on the left, we call it our bacterial palette. And you can see the different, you know, the reds and the, and the purple and the yellows. You know, and, you know, we actually have some blue ones and some other colors as well, but that was that, was that year's palette. And so if we have expired plates, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let some of the students, uh, usually right before a holiday, you know, make some uh, picture, you know, make some bacterial art. And the picture on the right was one of uh, our favorites from that year. And uh, I guess it's a piece of abstract art. It might be an eye, actually, now that I look at it. <laughs> sure. Maybe maybe it's a pink <laughs> eye. I don't know. So, um, All seeing eye. Yes. Yeah, and maybe, it's, maybe the purple is the microbiome on the eye. So maybe that's <laughs> what that was supposed to be. So anyway, that was one of the examples of microbial art. And that can be a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> A 
popular. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> this one's kind of a fun one too. I don't know if you have the answer for this, but um, do you know if microgravity affects the eye microbiome? Is there research on that? Um, this person is commenting that astronauts return with poor vision. So I, I, one time I made a joke saying that I want to, I want to make the first claim on uh, sort of the microbiome of space. I don't think anybody's actually looked at it though, but I would be very interested in, in looking at that or things like that. But, but we do know that uh, microgravity can affect how bacteria behave. So there have been papers showing that uh, like Pseudomonas originosa forms a better biofilm under microgravity. So uh, there, you know, there could be something to it. But I think the reason, the main reason why astronauts have vision problem is they're exposed to a lot more damaging rays, you know, uh, that, you know, our atmosphere helps filter up and they're just, uh, you know, our retina is, is sensitive and those cells can get injured. Oh, it's such a wonder. Um, okay, another question. We have a few questions about eye drops and medicine, but um, maybe you guys can think of a general answer about like, what is the extent of antibiotics becoming effective or ineffective due to overuse and how like eye drops play a role in the eye with the microbiome? Tony, I'll start with the antibiotics if you want to do the, the drops. Um, so, Go for it. Go for it. So antibiotic resistance, of course, is a, is a, is a global problem. It's a really big deal. Um, in the eye, we're a little bit more lucky. Uh, it hasn't been to the same extent where we see a, a, a massive amount of like pan resistant microbes. That means they're resistant to every single antibiotic, for example. Um, you know, so for, for example, in the, in the bladder, you know, uh, urinary tract infections, you know, they're really worried about pan resistant microbes and there's nothing that they can treat them with, right? And this can be deadly. In the eye, we still have quite a few useful antibiotics. And the nice thing is we can apply them directly in the eye uh, versus taking them in our body. So we can apply a lot more. <laughs> so you can get a much higher concentrations. Now that said, there are you know, instances of MRSA, you know, methicillin resistant Staph aureus and uh, fluoroquinolone resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa. You know, we do see that, but luckily, for now, it's not as, as, as bad news as is the rest of the body. Yeah. And then I agree with, with everything Rob said. Okay. And so for the eye drops thing, uh, I think anytime you do anything, it's going to affect your microbiome. Even if you think about your gut, the type of food you eat can totally shift it. So I think anytime you put something in your eye that has the potential to affect it, we do know we've done some sort of anecdotal experiments with the bacteria I talked about in the recording, and we see that it does grow better whenever we um, incubate it with uh, artificial tears. So there is something to the tear environment, to the artificial tear environment that, that helps at least this good bacterium grow. We're still trying to figure out how it sort of affects it um, in, in a host or in vivo. Yeah, I'm finding it really interesting to learn more and more about the good bacteria versus the bad bacteria um, and how they interact with each other and support each other or don't support each other. Um, another question coming in, um, somebody's wondering if their eye floaters are bacteria. I'm imagining they're talking about those little like blue dots that kind of float around when you look at like the blue sky. Yeah, sh sure. Uh, as, as my understanding is, so the back of the eye, or you know, a large portion of the eye is actually filled with a, vis a viscous fluid called the vitreous. And as you get older, that tends to thin out a little bit, the, the consistency uh, changes and it becomes less viscous. And sometimes you get uh, collagen fibers kind of bundle up and they're like just little protein fibers. So I, I think generally that's what you're seeing. Um, and there are some instances, however, where inflammation like uveitis, which is inflammation of part of the inside of the eye, that can promote that or parts of the retina in extreme cases can come off and that could cause that. But to my understanding, they're not microbe oriented. Uh, however, you know, it is possible that, you know, if your inflammation inside the eye is due to microbes, that might promote them. But I don't think what you're actually seeing are clumps of microbes. 
I was really hoping you were going to say, yeah, we can see all of the little critters <laughs> coming across our eyes. <laughs> well, I, mean, I imagine if you had that many microbes in your eye, you would have a very severe inflammatory uh, response. So, you know, I think that's a, that wouldn't be what you'd be worried about. <laughs> uh, this is kind of a fun one, too. If you personally had to give up one component of your eye microbiome, what would that be? Um, like what would be the last one that you gave up to? You know, there was a paper that came out maybe in 2016 or 17 by um, Russ Van Gelder's group. And it was Twee Duan was the first author. And I think uh, they they did the ocular virome. So not only there are microbes, but there are viruses and that's what they're characterizing. And there was this virus called Torctenovirus that I'd never heard of. Uh, but apparently is ubiquitous. And they found, I think, like 60 or 70% of the healthy patients had this viral or the signature of this virus on their eye. And right now, again, this is one of those unanswered questions. We don't know what it's doing there. We don't know if it's causing problems or helping out. But uh, that's probably the one I would rather not have. <laughs> How about you, Tony? I I'm pretty happy with the microbiome I have. I'm I'm sort of concerned. I think when you try to pick out any individual part of it, it sort of disrupts the entire system. So I'm I'm of the mind that if it's not broken, you know, don't fix it. So <laughs> I'll keep everything I have. <laughs> that's probably that's probably a good point, right? So if things are out of whack, it's you know dysbiosis, right? And that's when you know the immune system starts getting involved and. You know, you could have actually further problems by removing something. Right? All right. Um, we have another question. So early on in the program, you were talking about different plates and the pros and cons of using them in order to see bacteria grow. Um, this person wants to know, when you talk about different plates, do you mean agar versus other substrates and sub substances? Yeah, I'm sorry for being a little ambiguous on that. So um, most th the plates that we deal with are Petri plates and these Petri plates have different nutrient qualities. So they all have auger in them to keep them solid. Otherwise they just you know, be liquid. And, uh, but some of them have uh, like ground up soybeans as a nutrient source. Other ones have ground up yeast extract plus sugar, you know, and, and some of them have those, those sheep blood cells, right? So depending on what you have in there, what nutrient, basis you have will determine what bacteria can grow. So that's really what we're getting at. Uh, another question, do you have a suggestion on reading material, high level review articles and whatnot on the eye microbiome? So since Tony is still muted, so I'll start. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, there's a nice one by uh, Mike Ziegens and Russ Van Gelder. And maybe we can make a list of these. I, I, you know, uh, there's a nice new one by um, uh, Jerome Ozkan and Mark Wilcox. I mean, there are quite a few out there. Uh, Tony, do you have a, a favorite? I guess your own. Tony has a nice I think one the, with the, Rachel Caspi. <laughs> yeah, not to self-publicize. We did write one, but um, I think the Wilcox one is, is very good. And, and Russ Van Gelder always has. Any of his papers on the microbiome are, are very good, I think. And, um, you know, and any of the papers on the oxide microbiome really just sort of describe how these different things affect the microbiome, like geography, like if you wear contact lenses, whether you have dry eye or something like that. So I think it really describes the differences in, in how the microbiome is affected by different things. Super, super curious. All right. Um, one other question. In clinical practices, do you know, um, are there specialists in ophthalmology who can actually culture whatever is growing on our eyelids for individual diagnostic purposes yet? Or is this still just all in the research phase? Okay. So I, I think we do that at Pitt right now, right, Rob? Like, we, you know, Reach does that, takes the swabs and grows the bacteria up and then types it, right? So I think it's pretty, it's, it's, it's a pretty common occurrence now, I think. Yeah, and that's right. But it's generally only done in people that have issues, right? <laughs> like where they suspect an infection. So, you know, healthy people, unless it's part of a specific study, won't get swabbed to see what's 
what's growing there. And uh, usually we do it if they have a, you know, a severe ocular infection or it appears that they have an infection. So yeah, that technology is, al is already out there. Great. Well, we are wrapping up on an hour of this program, so I'm going to call it quits for the day, but it has been just so fantastic to be in conversation with you. Everything that you have been speaking about and researching is utterly fascinating. So thank you so much for joining us. And if you're ever in the city in San Francisco, we are opening our doors soon to the public in person, not just virtually. So, so you'll have to come and visit and stay tuned about that. Of course. Thanks, Thanks so for much. having us. Yeah. yeah, I really look forward to visiting the museum. <laughs> <laughs>